Ethan, why don't you talk a little bit? My experience ranges from everything pretty much. I'm mostly a software engineer at heart. So I try to automate my solutions as uh, to the best of my knowledge and using the tech stack that's currently of, available. Now you want to talk about VM containers and serverless. So I guess a good spot to give some context is your current environment that you deal with is mostly containers or serverless, or is it VMs or is it mix? Yeah, this is actually great. My current environment is a mix of virtual machines and containers. We're not leveraging serverless specifically because of the business, the way the business is focused on. And we are currently moving towards containers and in a sense that we can also leverage cloud agnostic processes. Is those containers mostly on Kubernetes or is it standalone containers or? hundred percent Kubernetes right now. So like we're moving towards Kubernetes at the moment. Cool. Is it like the GCP kind of flavor or is it on AWS or is it even, is it self-managed or not self-managed there? No, we use uh, GKE at the moment, uh, Google Kubernetes engine. So you're in the transition from VMs to mostly it sounds like containers and running in Kubernetes. Where do you see this transition to serverless? Why would you like to get off containers or do you want to get off containers? In my opinion is like every approach has its own uses. Yep. So there's a place for virtual machines, a place for containers and a place for serverless. This morning I was actually like reading a few articles and first it looks like serverless is, is making us go back to the sixties and seventies where we had time shared mainframes. But it's always a cycle, right? We go from one thing yeah. like centralized to decentralized to centralized yeah. to decentralized. It, it's pretty much just a cycle, but thinking about the technology. Right now, containers is like both, both of the good parts of the both world. So you still have some control regarding your infrastructure, but also it allows you to ship things faster. Serverless, I understand they have specific use cases. It pretty much not, uh, one size fits all. So when you say serverless, because it can be mean many things and there's different blends of it. The example that I was thinking is, I know you're on GCP, but I, I know you're aware of AWS side. Do you consider it serverless on like the Fargate EKS stuff where it's, you don't have nodes within your Kubernetes cluster. Those are on demand. You don't really even own those resources. The cloud provider just steps in when you ask for them, or is it more the true peer serverless of like. You don't even have a cluster. It's just lambdas. It's just entirely on the cloud provider. You deploy your container. They manage everything else. Yeah. This is an actual, this is an interesting hot topic. At least for me, the serverless part was introduced by AWS Lambda. So more, I think more of a function as a service. And with that, there are a few pros and cons, but also if you think about platform as a service, then serverless could potentially be. Okay, I have this container, I just deploy it and I don't care about the underlying infrastructure. And I understand that for functional service, we have AWS Lambda and on the other side, we have Google Cloud, which is the container running. Yeah. I'm at the sweet spot of looking like the Fargate EKS stuff. And I do see some, I think Google calls it their autopilot cluster in GKE now, where you don't actually have the nodes anymore. They manage that. You just show up with the pending pods and they just fulfill it. What you basically have in those scenarios is the control plane and that's essentially it. But you do still have a lot of the cloud providers, a lot of the flexibility, but some of it is good as function of service. Do you think that the Lambda serverless experience has, or function as a service is probably a better way of saying it, like matured to the point of seeing more adoption? Because every time I jump into this, I always feel like the tooling is a nightmare. I know deploying things on Lambda, I'm always like, how do I test this locally? How do I mock out everything else it's doing? How do I run this to mimic the same spot? And I almost feel like you end up building this function as service, let's say it's a Lambda. And then I build it like this non-function as a service to be able to run that as a container somewhere else to actually test. Uh, what are your thoughts? Has it matured enough or not? No, in fact, it's one of the downsides that I noticed. You can write the function locally and test the code itself. But then the whole ecosystem around the function, it's hard to test. So you need to mock or if, or even worse, 
if you're if you want your solution to be cloud agnostic, you really, really can because all the ecosystem needs to be focused on a particular cloud vendor. I think more and more that Kubernetes is going to actually chip away at the clouds and the services they offer, the serverless functionality that the cloud providers provide, or even like on Amazon, the Fargate experience is less valuable than it was four years ago. If I can deploy to Kubernetes and I have something like my example is Airflow that lets me do these functions of service triggers and in crons and whatnot. Great. Once I have my Kubernetes cluster, like I'm good. I don't need to worry about, okay, we have to run this thing on AWS and this thing on GCP and this thing in Azure. I just need a managed service of the Kubernetes cluster on each cloud. Once I'm there, I like just deploy my health charts or whatever, if you're not using health. Once that infrastructure is set up, I'm good to go. I'm cloud agnostic. Do you think it's heading this way or do you think I'm just crazy and you're like, no, serverless is going to make a total comeback. It's all going to be Lambdas. <laughs> no, in fact, you're, you're right. Kubernetes already became like the standard of our industry yep. nowadays. And if you really need to be cloud agnostic, you like your baseline is Kubernetes to start writing something. And yeah, I... the way I understand uh, serverless is like a real specific use case. You can break the problem down to a, a point where you can run like several different functions in two or three minutes. That could be a potential use case. But for something like a web server that it just shows like a hello world, it's pretty much overkill. Yeah. I, I don't know how much you've seen from the Amazon side, but they are very aggressive. Is probably the correct word with their ECAS any, as well as their Kubernetes connect service is what they call it. So they're taking the stance of, we don't care where you want to run your Kubernetes data plane. We don't even care if you want to run a separate Kubernetes cluster, not a part of the Amazon but you would like to have this merge into a single control plane. I, I think this is quite smart because the big thing is I don't want to have like three different terraforms or whatever to be like, this is the Azure Kubernetes managed service. This is the Google cloud. What I actually want is I want the flexibility of just being like, cool, GCP compute over here. Okay. Azure compute over here, AWS compute over here. And arguably it's sure. I have this single pane view at AWS, but I could also run GCP Kubernetes if I want it or Azure Kubernetes. It's like a lie we tell ourselves, I think, that we're cloud agnostic. And then when you look in, you're like, wait, you bank on S3. Like mm -hmm. you're literally using things that are using like the S3 path and it's, you're not moving anytime soon. Like now there's application code change. Not, not only that, even the cold managing everything else, like user permissions. Uh, the yeah. actual Kubernetes nodes, if you chose to use that particular service also comes into account. So th there's no way to go hundred percent cloud agnostic regard if you're using everything as a code, like there's no way, like at least your baseline will be locked in that particular cloud provider. K Kubernetes improvement plans are taking more and more strides towards like abstraction of the file system with the CSI drivers and things like this. I know there is honestly min.io, which is like, cool. I want an S3 API compatible thing that I can use and abstract the file system. So you pretend like it's S3, you make the rest API call, and then behind that, it could be GCP mm -hmm. object stored. But you are right. The other thing I do see is like the RBAC stuff, like waiting for the community to have a generic way of being like, you don't. Yeah. You define everything in the Kubernetes cluster, and then you have a mapping to your cloud providers behind that. How long do you think that's going to take? Do you, or do you even think that's going to be possible? Wow. Possible? Definitely. But then I'm afraid that Kubernetes can end up doing too much stuff, right? That's like, always the fear. Yeah. Do, doing too much. So when you have a bug somewhere, like everything falls apart. So th th this is my fear that. Kubernetes can become if it isn't already, because I know that you can actually provision certain cloud resources from Kubernetes itself, like, uh, load balancers, etc. I was going to say it's like, uh, and this is the appeal of serverless. It's like some of the stuff that you're not worried about. You're just like, what is load balancer? That's not my problem. Yeah. I think that the evolution of serverless is not quite here. I mean, I, I feel like it's a hype. 
I feel like uh, I thought this three years ago, maybe four years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't see this happening anytime soon. I'm like, I see some value. Like I definitely understand if you're a hundred percent committed to AWS four years ago, I'm like, yeah, like Lambdas are your world. Like you will solve the other problems we talked about of like testing and things like this. And if you don't plan to leave the cloud provider, then, you know, I, I see great value in it, not having to do that yourself. But if you're in the spot and I think there are more and more companies are saying like, Hey, we would like to not be a hundred percent stuck. It doesn't mean that we need to be cloud agnostic fully, but we definitely want the position of mm -hmm. someday having the opportunity and not be like, well, company A shows up and your price is going to double and you're like, and they're like, you can't even leave. Like uh -huh. you're so baked into our system. You'll never leave. Yeah. Th this is a uh, worst fear most companies have. However, I remember a survey a few years ago and actual, the actual fear of lock-in lowered. So it was like 50% uh, some years ago. And then the other survey like lowered to 20. It is a concern, but it depends what's your actual strategy. Because business-wise, if you're gonna support several different cloud providers, that means you're always stretching your engineering, which is an, another challenge. Companies are uh, struggling for resources, like everywhere. Like you don't have enough engineers to handle all of the problems. So you need pretty much need to pick and choose. And by all means, you can't really focus on being 100% cloud agnostic. So you try your best and try to manage the expectations around that. This does come back to some of the conversation we we're talking about, like the VM container and serverless, and you saying like they each have their own place. I think they each also have their own place in terms of company size. Like mm -hmm. it is in the early days, a lot easier or reduction of bandwidth capacity. They just go, not my problem. I'm just using Lambdas. It's all function as a service. It's all on AWS. We'll pay it on the bill but it saves on the development time. Maybe down the road, it bites you in the butt. You're like, oh God, we have to move everything up and whatever, but the business evolves. And then as you grow and because there's an operational overhead, as I'm sure with the Kubernetes, even on the managed service, because mm. you still need to understand how it works from the data plane side of actually deploying on it. But even if the control plane is managed, there are still times where I'm like, okay, the control plane breaks. Now what? Mm. Even if it's a managed service, where do I go for the logs? Ask me, you have no, did we enable the logs yeah. for the control plane? And that's when you find out, no. And then you're like, uh oh, how do we debug that? I yeah. Not only that, we enable the logs, where they're going and how much are we paying for that? Function of service, I definitely see it. I, I, I do see extreme value on, on those local zones. If you could run something at, at the pop level, like the point of presence or basically essentially the cell towers. Like there are a lot of things you can offload from backholding it all the way to the data center or whatnot. And I think serverless has some advantage on that side in terms of billing on the external providers. If you're Verizon or at and like you have limited bandwidth from that cell tower all the way back to AWS. Ideally from your perspective, you're like, cool, your company, Corey, and you want lower latency. And I only have to do from the device to the cell tower and that's it. I don't have to go from the cell tower all the way back to the inner exchange and then to the AWS. Like you're incentivized to say, yeah, it, this is like mm -hmm. the whole reason to why we ha even have the inner exchanges, right? Like the peering and whatnot and less, less backhaul on the backbone and everything. That's an interesting take, uh, but there's only so much you can push to the edge. Yeah. I mean, a compromise between the two would be optimize for the edge, like meaning you don't, you won't have that much bandwidth between the cell tower and the, the customer. So minimize the data required to get things done. And that's a challenge in, in itself, but yeah, it's an interesting concept. I think that's where the big push is. Like I, I know, uh, Cloudflare is big push is, I believe they call it web workers, which is essentially being able to run a piece of code at Cloudflare CDN itself. Mm -hmm. So now you don't necessarily just need like static resources. You got to be able to run some logical functions on Cloudflare's, I, I don't know how, like 165 points of presence and whatever. If you can perform some logic there and not have to 
push everything back. Just simple cases of like validation, like maybe some caching, but I guess these are like basic functions around caching, like whether or not like things that you used to do on your own server, Hey, we should drop the cache if blah, 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 or we think this, or if we believe the user is now going to load the next page, like more predictive stuff to try and mitigate the number of requests coming back. And that's the perfect case for like function as a service. You said it's, I don't need this crazy container. What I need is essentially a function to run with some logic as close to the user as I can get to determine whether or not I need to go back all the way. Do you think there's really any open shift and run VM yourself scenario anymore? Or do you think the bulk of places should shift to this container in Kubernetes world and like bare metal outside of some caveats? In all honesty, honestly, I think maybe like privacy and VPNs are like a good use case to run your own stuff. So meaning if, if you really need to have hundred percent of control of your stack, you can run your own hard. And that's one of the use cases I can see. Yeah. I, I, and maybe I'm just sold on the big cloud providers. I'm like, look, I'm probably not going to do it better than that. And they, they have all the certifications. Great. It's pretty hard to be in the privacy section that the other providers don't already cover. Yeah. That, that's the point of uh, business wise. If you're a VPN company. You may choose to run your own hardware, but besides yep. that particular use case, I can't really think about any, anything else software wise, like you just need somewhere to run, but as far as I know, you can run like your whole software in a Raspberry Pi if you manage. E even on the, the bandwidth side, like even for the VPN, it, unless it's part of your service where you're like, look, the way that we provide the services, we literally spin up a whole new box just for you to connect on your VPN. And that's like your marketing selling pitch is like total isolation. It's just you. It, it, it's a non-shared host, single tenant, but for everything else, it's okay. Maybe the VPN company that doesn't do that, we have VMs, but then we run Kubernetes on it and you get your own pod and we try our best for isolation and our service is three ninety nine. If you want the total single tenant, you pay the $15 a month because that company needs to charge for the actual, the physical box behind that. Yeah. Uh, so if you think about, if you, we think about extreme cases, we'll always find something. So let me take off my uh, tinfoil hat and yes, the evolution is towards like minimizing operations and try to focus more on the business. So at least for now, I see that containers are pretty much the bread and butter to achieve that goal. And, but on the other side, serverless, it's the way we're heading towards, but we are not mature enough. And for the moment, there are only limited use cases, such as like something at the edge or some one-off uh, process that can run pretty quick. Yeah. I, a piece of me is just like trying to imagine how it actually goes fully that way. And I just have such a hard time grasping it. Like from VM to containers, like even when it first came out, it was quite obvious to me, like this is going to be a big shift. Like I can see why and like just on the resource constraints. It's, yeah. Okay. Right there. I can run a lot of these small things with the same kind of isolation I expect, but not need to have this entirely separate OS. Okay. Great. Like that means, but on the serverless side, I, I really grasped at Strala's. No. It was a pleasure talking. Thanks for watching. Like the video if you enjoyed today's episode of Between Two Devs. Subscribe for more content from us and get notified when the next episode releases.